one. If y'all would open in your Bible to Isaiah chapter two. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter two. As you can tell, the title for our lesson this morning, The Mountain of the Lord's House. The Mountain of the Lord. We're going to look in to our final mountain this morning. We've been going through this series on the mountains of God. But let's notice what Isaiah tells us in Isaiah chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amaz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. As I mentioned a moment ago, we began a series about 10 weeks ago, 11 weeks ago, on the mountains of God. And what we've done in looking at these mountains of God, we've gone into the Bible, primarily the Old Testament. We've looked at a few in the New Testament. But we've looked at these different mountaintop experiences that the people of God had. We looked, of course, at the mountains of Ararat. And you remember that when Noah came down out of that ark. The first thing he did when he got off the ark was to build an altar and worship and offer a sacrifice to God. As we've continued through this, we've looked at various mountains. We spent one day looking at Mount Moriah, that mountain where God commanded Abraham, I want you to go to this mountain and I want you to offer your only son. And we see that Abraham, being an obedient man, went immediately, rose up early, the Bible says, the next morning, and he left. And he went to Mount Moriah. He was ready to offer Isaac on that mountain, but the angel of the Lord stayed his hand with a knife in his hand, and God said, I'm not going to, and I'm paraphrasing obviously, I'm not going to require you to kill your son. There's a ram in the bush you can offer that as a sacrifice. We looked at that very same mountain and we find in 2 Samuel that David, when he had sinned against God, I'm sorry, 1 Samuel, when he had sinned, no, it's 2 Samuel, when he had sinned against God, he, uh, he uh, wanted to offer a sacrifice. So he comes to a threshing floor on Mount Moriah and he finds this man out working in the field and he goes to that man and says I, I want to I buy the animals I want to buy the wood I want to buy this so that I can offer a sacrifice to God and you remember the man said no you're the king you can have it all and he said I will not offer unto God anything that costs me nothing and we learn later in the books of Kings and Chronicles that that's the very same place where Solomon built the temple. And so Solomon built the temple on Mount Moriah. We came to the pages of the New Testament and we found that Jesus was offered on Mount Moriah. And so these mountaintops that we've looked at, they have been moments where God's people have worshipped and sacrificed and we find that on that Mount Moriah, that God actually sacrificed His Son for us. Well, why did God do all that? Well, we find an indication in Isaiah chapter 2. God all along was planning to build the mountain of the Lord's house. And He wanted His Son to be the one 
that built that house. And so Isaiah tells us that this would come to pass in the last days. Uh, We've talked about this on numerous occasions and you all understand this. We are now living in the last days. Not the last days as our religious friends around us would say, Oh, the signs, and boy, they're, they're really having a heyday right now. They're talking about we just had an eclipse, and now Iran is after Israel, so we know we're living in the end times, and we're about to be, the church is about to be raptured into heaven, and it's going to be the great battle of our... They, they're talking all this stuff, and there's one word that describes it all. Nonsense. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches us that the last days began in Acts chapter 2 at the establishment of the church. And you can read in Acts chapter 2 where Peter quotes from Joel the prophet. And Joel said in the last days it will come to pass. And you can find in Acts 2 and about verse 16 that Peter said this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, in the last days, he said. So the last days began at the establishment of the church in Acts chapter 2. And they will end when Jesus returns. The reason the Bible speaks of them is the last days. This is the last dispensation that God is going to be dealing with man. We remember in the very beginning of the Bible, beginning with Adam, going on and we could go through Abraham and we could talk about Isaac and Jacob. God was dealing with them in what we call the patriarchal law. God would actually speak to the Father. The Father would function as the high priest and He would reveal God's message to His family on how to worship, how to sacrifice, how to do all the things that were necessary for them to do. But we remember that in the book of Exodus, that God in Exodus chapter 20 made a covenant with the nation of Israel. It's also recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And He gives the Jewish people a unique law. And that law was unique in one sense because it was written by the very finger of God. And Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 10. And so the Jews were living and worshiping God under the Mosaic law. The patriarchs worshiping God under the patriarchal law. Those two dispensations ended in the book of Acts. And now we are living in the last dispensation of God called the Christian dispensation by some, called the church age by others. Whatever terminology you want to use, Jesus Christ is now sitting at the right hand of the Father. He is living to make intercession for us and He is our high priest, He is our King and we are worshiping under the covenant of the New Testament. Now brethren, that's crystal clear and that's exactly what Isaiah and Joel and others as we will see in just a moment was talking about. The mountain of the Lord's house Verse number 2 is going to be established in the last days. And it shall be established, he said, in the top of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills. It will be, as we said throughout this series, the tallest mountain of all. This is the tallest mountain God has... it, It dwarfs Mount Everest. Mount Everest is just a tiny hill compared to the mount of the Lord's house. And so we're talking about this morning the mountain of the Lord's house. So the question that we need to ask and answer first of all in my estimation, what is this mountain of the Lord's house? Well, not only did Isaiah talk about it and Joel talk about it, But we find that Daniel the prophet also spoke of it. So let's now turn to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. By the way, I've spoken of this on other occasions and you remember that I've given you a, a little teaching thing to help you remember twos for you to remember. Twos for you to remember. And if you can remember Isaiah chapter 2 
Joel chapter 2 and Acts chapter 2. If you can remember those two, so all you've got to remember is Isaiah and Daniel and Acts and go to the second chapter and you can answer all the questions that people might ask about the building of the church. They all pointed to this one day where Jesus is crucified, where Jesus is buried, where Jesus is resurrected. He ascended and sat down at the right hand of God and He is now living to make intercession for us. And so as we turn to Daniel chapter 2, I would like for us to begin our reading in verse number 26. You remember that at the beginning of this chapter, that or at the beginning of this book, you remember that the children of Israel had left God so uh, often and so many times that God is finally punishing them and He sends the nation of Israel into 70 years of Babylonian captivity. Isaiah looking through the lens of prophecy, prophesied that that was going to happen. Jeremiah the prophet said it will last for 70 years. Daniel is one of those young men, probably maybe a teenager even, who is brought into that Babylonian captivity. And y'all remember this. So now Daniel is a prophet living in the Babylonian captivity. He ascends to where he is going to actually interpret the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had a dream. Couldn't remember what it was. Didn't know what it meant. So he calls all his wise men. No man is able to answer. And then they say, well, Daniel can do it. And so Daniel goes to Nebuchadnezzar. He tells him the dream. Let's pick up in verse 26. Then the king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. I love verse 28. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and it maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be, listen to the terminology, in the latter days. He's going to tell you, king, what is going to happen in the last days, the latter days. At long, Nebuchadnezzar, long after you're dead and buried, long after the Babylonian nation has perished in ashes, in ashes on the last days, the last days, this is what's going to happen. So that's the dream, Nebuchadnezzar, that you had. Thy dream, we're still in verse 28. And the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, the thoughts came unto thy mind upon thy bed. What shall come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets, that's God, maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sake that should make known the interpretation of the king and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. Listen to verse 31. Thou, O king, sawest, this is what you saw in your dream. Behold, a great image, a great statue, a statue, this great image whose brightness was excellent stood before thee and the form thereof was terrible. Not necessarily frightening, but awesome. It was an awesome statue that you saw. He says in verse 32, This image head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Now listen carefully to beginning in verse 34. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands. Now I want you to pause there and notice the supernatural beginning of that stone. It's not a stone that somebody carved out with their hand. It's not a stone like somebody would go down to the quarry and carve out this stone. 
It was cut, Daniel said, without man's hand. That means it is supernatural in its origin. The church is not something that men can build. The church is built by the hands of God and by the hands of God alone. And he tells us this stone was cut without hand which smote the image. So you saw this great statue. And as you're looking at that great statue, you saw the head of gold and he describes all the way down to the feet. And he says as you're seeing this great image, this great statue, there's also a stone that is cut, but it's cut without man's hand. And notice what that stone does. It says that it break them to pieces. So the statue is utterly destroyed by the stone. Well, we're going to find out what that stone is in just a moment, and we're going to find out what happens to that stone. Notice verse 35. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together. So they are ground into powder, he says. Continuing in verse 35, they became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. I've got to drive down a peg. Our premillennialist friends are telling us that there is going to be a reviving of that ancient Roman empire. Well, brethren, what did Jesus say or what did Daniel say through the inspiration of God? That Roman Empire and that Greek Empire and that Mede and Persian Empire and that Babylonian Empire are ground into powder. They are blown away like the chaff in the threshing floor. And notice that Daniel says there is no place found for them. There, that's one of the key thoughts of premillennialism. And brethren, this passage destroys... There never, there's not going to be a revision of some new Roman empire where the Antichrist, as they say, is going to sit and he's going to take over the world. No, the Bible says that when God ground those empires, can we say it, to the ground and poof, with his breath blew them away, they will never be revived. And brethren, it is false for these men to preach that. And yet they're having a field day right now preaching that exact same thing. You can hear it on the radio. You can hear it on the television. You can open up your computer and you can find they're saying, Oh, it's about to happen. It's about to happen. Brethren, it's not. And it says they were carried away with the wind. We're still in verse 35. And there was no place found for them. But I want you to know, that he says, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole world. I want you to see that in verse number 35 that Daniel very clearly says this stone which broke the Roman Empire as well as the Grecian, the Medes and Persians and the Babylonian Empire This stone becomes a great mountain. So what are we talking about? We're talking about the mountain of the Lord's house. Now I know I asked the question, what is that mountain? We're getting there, so just stay with me. We're going to answer that question in a moment. But I want you to know that this stone, Daniel says, filled the whole world. Now I am not subscribing to a flat earth when I put this picture up here. I'm just telling you, This is the whole earth, okay? And that stone filled the whole earth. The Apostle Paul would tell us in Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 23 that the gospel of Jesus Christ had been preached to every creature under heaven. They had gone into all the world. The gospel was spread to every, now listen carefully, every location where man dwelt if there was a person there God in his providence and even during the first century in the miraculous times if there was a person 
God got somebody there to preach the gospel to him. Now how did he do that? I don't know. I don't know how he did that. But I know Paul said that he did. And so whatever Paul said happened, happened. And he didn't just preach. And I, I've even heard some uh, preachers in the Lord's church say, well, he was just talking about the known world up in this area, Europe and Asia and down into Africa. But they didn't know about North America. They didn't know about South America. They didn't know about Australia. So they didn't go over there. No, that's not true. Brethren, if there was a person there, God got the message to them. So uh, he says that it would fill the whole earth. Now notice as we go to verse number 35. Or I'm sorry, verse number 36. Daniel says, this is the dream. That's what you dreamed, Nebuchadnezzar. Now I'll tell you what it meant. This is the interpretation thereof before the king. Verse 37. This language is crystal clear. No need to misunderstand it. Nobody can confuse you if you just read what Daniel said. So Daniel said in verse 37, Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell... The beast of the field and the fowls of heaven hath he given unto thine hand and hath made thee ruler of them all. Listen to the end of verse 38. Thou art this head of gold. So there is the statue. And in that statue there was a head of gold. And Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar that represents you and that represents the Babylonian empire. That's what he said. So we don't have any question about it. That's the Babylonian empire. Alright, so we move on. He says in verse 39, And after thee shall rise another kingdom inferior to thee. Well, we all know our history. And we know that after the Babylonian empire, there were the Medes and the Persians. By the way, they are actually named later on in the book of Daniel. We're not going to take the time to reference them. But we know beyond a shadow of a doubt, the second empire, which was an inferior empire, was the Medes and the Persians. That empire, ultimately headed by uh, 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 Persia. The Medes kind of faded out and it became the great Persian empire. And so, he continues in verse 39, he said, There shall arise another kingdom, that's the Medes and the Persians, but notice, inferior to thee, and then another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. He's talking about the Greek empire. We all know this. The Grecian empire. We remember that Grecian empire. And we remember how it was spread over all the world. And by the way, they find Greek inscriptions all over the world. This is not something that is just in the Bible. And I'm not saying that... In a, in, a, in a negative way, I'm saying that even secular history recognizes what we're talking about. So the Grecian Empire. And then he says in verse 40, the fourth kingdom. Now that's the one that is the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire. And again, the Roman Empire has been known all over the globe. Do you know that they have actually found in a cave in Colorado? A Roman soldier's uh, shield? Now how did that get there? How did that Roman soldier... And coins. They found coins. Roman coins all over the world. Well, how did they get there? Because there was a worldwide trade established even in those days. So this Roman Empire, the fourth kingdom, listen to it in verse 40, shall be strong as iron. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, you know that you can take an iron um, hammer uh, and you can break all kinds of gold and brass. They, they have no resistance to iron. <laughs> iron is strong. And so he says, this kingdom is going to be strong like iron. Just as iron breaks in pieces and subdueth all things, as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas, listen carefully to verse 41, 
Whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron. So as he looked at this great stature, he saw that at the bottom, the legs and the feet being of iron. And he noticed that in the feet, it was iron mixed with clay. And if you know anything about metal, you know iron and clay do not mix. And so what he's saying here is that this kingdom, verse 41, shall be divided. But there shall be in it the strength of iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clays. And the toes of the feet, verse 42, were part of iron and part of clay. So the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. We can read in biblical history, we can read in secular history that the Roman Empire, as strong as it was, had weaknesses. One of the weaknesses, when they went in and conquered a nation, they would actually tell them you can either die or you can become a Roman citizen. Many people became Roman citizens. And because of that, there was division in the Romans, in the Roman Empire. You can see that even in the pages of the New Testament. We were reading in Acts a few moments ago. And we noticed that the Romans were there. The Grecians were still there. So those leftover Grecians. And there's friction that develops between these peoples. That's what Daniel is talking about. So he says in verse 43, Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. I want you to underline it. Whatever you do to highlight it, I want you to see what Daniel said in verse 44. And in the days of these kings, well, what kings? The Roman kings. There's no way you can misunderstand that. During the days of the Roman kings, when we turn over to the New Testament and we start reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when you start reading them, one of the things that jumps off the page, it's talking about the Jewish people, but they are under Roman domination. Rome is the one that is ruling in the first century even over the Jewish people. So in the days of these kingdoms, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, written while the Jews were under the authority of the Roman kingdom, during these days, he says, During these kings shall the God of heaven, we're in verse 44, set up a kingdom. Now I've got a question, and you all know this. Premillennialism, the doctrine of premillennialism says, and I, I'm telling you, you can do the research on your own, although I don't encourage you to waste your time to do it. They will tell you that Jesus came to this earth to establish His kingdom. But the Jews, and you can even read in some of their writings, they will say, y'all have heard me say this a thousand times, they surprisingly rejected Jesus as their Messiah. And I've said also a thousand times, how do you surprise God? How do you surprise? How did God not know the Jews were going to reject Jesus? Well, the fact of the matter is, God knew it and He planned for it. And it's even written in the pages of the Old Testament that this was going to happen. The Jews were going to reject the Messiah. He was, according to Isaiah chapter 53, despised and rejected of men. According to John chapter 1, He came unto His own and His own received Him not. God was not surprised. So the question is, they say, well... The Jews surprisingly re rejected Jesus so he couldn't establish his kingdom and he's going to come back sometime in our future and he's going to establish the kingdom and he's going to reign on this earth for a thousand years. That's what they teach. And by the way, that's, that's across the board. Most of the major denominations teach that. That's across the board. Some have some uh, pre-rapture, post-rapture. They've got all these things that they throw in there. But that's the doctrine. And it's laid bare according to the Word of God. First of all, either Jesus built the kingdom when God said He would, or God is a liar. And I don't know about y'all, but I don't want to stand before God and say, God, you lied. Jesus didn't build the kingdom when you said He would. 
He was thwarted in building the kingdom and he's going to have to build it later on. Do you want to stand before God and try to argue with him on when Jesus built the kingdom? Either he did it or he didn't. Daniel and other prophets tell us that he did. So let's continue on. He says, in the days, we're still in verse 44. In the days of this, these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, watch this, which shall never be destroyed. You see, kingdoms come and go. But God's kingdom cannot be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Did you see that? This kingdom that Jesus built will stand forever. So now that kingdom is standing. When Jesus returns and we move into the next dimension, when we actually go to the very presence of God, that kingdom will still be standing, brethren. It's not going to fall. It will stand forever. Verse number 45, For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut uh, out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, the gold, and the great God of heaven. Listen as he draws this point. The great God of heaven hath made known unto the king what shall come to pass hereafter. Listen to this. The dream is uncertain. Is that what he said? No, the dream is certain. And the interpretation thereof is sure. And because of that, Nebuchadnezzar falls down on his face and worships God. Brethren, Jesus built the kingdom, and you see it on the board, during the days of the Roman kings. He did that, and there's no doubt about it. Now here's how we answer the question, and I'm going to give you a verse in just a moment to prove it. The kingdom is the church. The church of Christ. Built by our Lord and Savior almost 2,000 years ago. Still standing today. Still the bride of Christ. Still the kingdom of God. Still the church of God. The church of Christ. It stands to this very day. This, and I apologize, it's not real clear. But this is a graphic picture of what Nebuchadnezzar saw. How Daniel interpreted it in Daniel chapter 2. He does it in Daniel chapter 7, only he gives us another picture. It is a lion, a bear, a leopard, and a terrifying beast. He in Daniel chapter 9 says it's a ram and a goat. And he identifies every one of them. The Babylonian Empire, this is on the right. The Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, the Roman Empire. And we see in Daniel 2 and verse 44 that in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Brethren, that is as clear as it can be. So what we read in Isaiah chapter 2 a moment ago, we saw that Isaiah saw the mountain of the Lord's house. And this mountain, as we just said, is the church. And this mountain was designed to bring peace to the world. Not only did Isaiah see it, and Daniel see it, Joel saw it, but Micah the prophet also saw it. Let's turn to Micah chapter 4. Micah chapter 4. And I will tell you we're not going to spend as much time on Micah as we did on these other guys because we just don't have the time to do it. But let's go to Micah chapter 4. See the harmony of what these guys saw. Micah chapter 4 beginning in verse number 1. But in the last days, well that phrase ought to be already explained to you. You understand it. In the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and it shall be exalted above the hills and all people shall, or people shall flow unto it. That sounds kind of like what Isaiah said, does it not? Sounds like what Joel said and Daniel said. And so he envisions this stone that was cut out with man's hand becoming a great mountain and it's going to be exalted. There's not going to be a mountain that even comes close to this mountain of God. Many nations, verse 2, shall come and say, Come and let us go up 
to the mountain of the Lord's house, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways. We will walk in his path. For the law shall go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. I'm not going to read further into that context, but I want you to know that Micah as well as other prophets of God told us that that would be built in the last days. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 16. I told you a moment ago that we would give you a verse proving what we're talking about. We've already given you some. Isaiah 2, Daniel 2, Joel 2, and Acts 2. But let's see what our Lord said about it. Let's see what Jesus said about it. You know that in verse 13 of Matthew 16, Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi. He asked His disciples saying, Whom do men say that I the Son of Man? And they said unto Him, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. In verse 15, Jesus said to them, But whom say ye that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ the Son of the living God. In verse 17, Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Verse 18. And I want you to listen carefully to what it says. I say also unto thee, Jesus says to Peter, Thou art Peter. Now I'm not a Greek scholar and I'm not trying to say that I am. But in the Greek language the word is Petros. And it means a small stone. And it is in the masculine gender. By the way I'm not going to spend time chasing this rabbit. There's only two genders. No matter what people are telling you today. There's not multiple genders like thousands or hundreds. Uh, There's two genders. This, well, actually, there's three. There's the masculine, feminine, and the neuter. So if you're going to be, you know, specific, the neutered, well, we're not going to go there. So two genders, masculine and feminine. This is in the masculine gender. Petros. Now notice as we continue. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee. Verse 19, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock. Now we know that the name Peter, Cephas, means a small stone. And it's in the masculine gender. The next word rock is Petra, feminine gender. So he's not talking about Peter. The Roman Catholic Church is wrong when they say that the church is built upon Peter. The church is not built on any man other than our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He is the rock. If you don't want to know a verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 4, the Bible says, and that rock which followed them was Christ. When you go to Matthew chapter 7, when Jesus is ending the Sermon on the Mount, He says, build your house on the rock. The rock is Jesus Christ. The church is not built on Peter. It's not even built on Peter's confession. It is built on Jesus Christ. And brethren, that's what the Bible teaches. And he says, upon this rock, upon myself, my fact that I am the Christ, the Son of God, I will build my church. Jesus said, I will build my church. At this point, the church has not been built. But Jesus looking into the future says there is coming a day when I will build my church. It's going to be that stone that was cut out with man's hand. That stone is going to become a great mountain and fill the earth. Earth, Jesus said, I will build my church. And I want you to look at that word church. It's singular. C-H-U-R-C-H. Jesus didn't say, I'm going to build a bunch of churches and you choose the church of your choice. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Listen to verse 19. How do I know that the church is the kingdom? How do I prove that? Look at verse 19. Jesus said to Peter, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So Peter, I want you to take these keys that I'm giving you. I want you to put them in your pocket and I want you to carry them around for at least 2,000 years. 
And then someday, I'll let you open the door to the kingdom. So where is Peter right now? Is he an old man, 2,000 years old, walking around somewhere in Israel and nobody knows who he is, just waiting to build that kingdom, to open the door, excuse me, not build the kingdom, open the doors to the kingdom? No, we know that Peter's dead. Peter's dead. So what good are those keys if the man that Jesus gave them to is dead already? Well, we know what good they are because Jesus built the church, Peter opened the door, and we can read about it in Acts chapter 2. And then Peter not only opened the door to the Jews, but in Acts chapter 10, which we almost got to in Bible class this morning, in Acts chapter 10, Peter used those very same keys to open the door to the Gentiles. Peter opened the doors. The church, the kingdom of God, has been established for 2,000 years almost. So brethren, the kingdom is the church, and the church is the mountain of the Lord's house. Now here's where we're going to take just a moment. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I want to remind you of something that we said. And as I'm reminding you, turn with me to John chapter 4. Brethren, many of those mountains, and I would say most of those mountains that we've already talked about, as we said, they were a place of worship and a place of sacrifice. So we, we now living on top of the mountain of God, the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What do you think God expects of us? Well, brethren, He wants worship. And Jesus said in John 4 and verse number 24, God is spirit and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. He told us in verse number 23 that God was searching for true worshipers. So brethren, I hope you see the point. And this is what we've been building up to throughout this entire series. The church of Christ is a place of worship to God. It's not a place where we just sit back and we get doled out some food. We see, and I'm talking about spiritual food, and we sing a few songs, we eat the Lord's. It is a place of worship. And God's people are a people of worship. And we know that Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2 that we are priests. The Old Testament priests, what did they do? They worshiped God and they led the nation of Israel in the worship of God. So brethren, God expects us as His priests today to worship Him. But not only did those mountains, be were they a place of worship, But they were also a place of sacrifice. I want you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Oh, we're going to find a wonderful verse that talks about sacrifice. We know, we know that God expects us to worship Him. We know that God expects sacrifice. And the Bible says in Hebrews 13 and verse number 15, By Him... Who is the Him? Jesus Christ. I said a moment ago in 1 Peter 2, we are priests of God. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 4 that Jesus is our high priest. And brethren, as we've talked about on many occasions, right now as we are worshiping God, Jesus Christ as our high priest is sitting right here with us and He is making intercession for us. Jesus Christ is here in His church and He is praising the Father just as we are praising the Father. And the Bible says, By Him, by Jesus Christ, let us therefore offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. What is that, uh, Paul? And I believe Paul wrote this book. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to His name. Do you remember the Bible telling us that Jesus Christ is is singing right now with us when we sing praises to God. He's leading us, brethren, in the worship of the Father. I've got another verse I want you to flip over to, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Oh, we're almost done. Y'all just uh, stay in your seat for a minute more. The Bible says in Romans 12 and verse number 1, I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. 
Brethren, the church is a place of worship. The church is a place of sacrifice. We pour out our hearts in praise to God. We give the fruit of our lips. But not only that, Paul tells us that our being is a life of living sacrifice. And brethren, I know I may be wrong, but I believe that Paul in his mind is going back to the thousands of animals, the millions of animals that were offered under the old law. Dead animals that Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 4 could not take away the sins of man. It's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to cleanse us of our sins. And so Paul is saying we're no longer under that old law. We're no longer offering up dead animals in sacrifice to God. We are offering ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I've talked about that word reasonable many times. In the Greek language, it's low, uh, logic, or in the English language, it's logic. We take it out of the Greek. It's logic. What is, what is Paul saying? I believe that God, Paul is saying God has done so much for you, brethren, that it is only logical and reasonable that you give your life back to Him as a living sacrifice. I don't think that's hard to understand. Verse 2, how do we do that? First of all, by not being conformed to this world. Brethren, don't let the world shape and mold your life. And when I'm talking about that, brethren, I hope you understand that the world is right now trying to shape and mold our lives. As I said a moment ago, the world is trying to get us to acknowledge that there are so many genders that we can't even count them. The world is trying to get us to acknowledge that denominational worship is okay with God. The world is getting us to try to believe that we ought to be more involved in politics than we ought to be in the Lord's church. Brethren, the world is after us all the time. And John tells us in 1 John 2, love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. Brethren, we must not allow the world to conform us. He says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. I love that word. We talked about it how many times? Metamorphosis is the word. At least that's the way we would say it. We got a lot of fuzzy caterpillars walking around right now. <laughs> you can't hardly go outside without stepping on a dozen. And one day, if you don't step on it, and some bird doesn't eat it, or somebody else, that little fuzzy caterpillar is going to turn into a beautiful butterfly. Metamorphosis. Brethren, the Christian goes through the process of metamorphosis. We sang a song a moment ago. Would Jesus, and I can't remember the exact words right off the top of my head, but y'all know, for such a worm as I. For such a worm as I. But Jesus said, you're no longer a worm. You're a beautiful butterfly. Oh, brethren, we need to live this in our lives. And when we do this, we prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Two lessons I want us to learn and then we're done. The church has always been in God's plan. And it's always been a place of worship and sacrifice. And brethren, the church predates denominationalism. That, that may be offensive to some. We are not denominational. We are the church that's revealed on the pages of this Bible. We predate Every denomination. And if you don't believe that, just go to secular world history. And they can give you the exact dates when every denomination was started. The Bible says the church was started by Jesus Christ in the city of Jerusalem in the first century. And you go and you compare every denomination you want and you will find that either a man or a woman or a group of men started them. Well, brethren, that's the wrong man. And you can look and you can see the location. The Bible says it's going to start in Jerusalem. Some of them started even in America. 
<laughs> Imagine that. Imagine that. Some of them started in Europe. Some of them started in Africa. Some of them started in Arabia. Wherever you want to go, you look at all of them. Well, brethren, that's the wrong place. They were started at the wrong time. We're told by secular history that in 606 B.C., Boniface III declared himself. Now, the, 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 the uh, start of it was already there, but in 606 A.D., a man had the I, I don't even I, 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 the audacity I mean I'm struggling for a word and the word that I keep wanting to say is stupidity but I know that offends people but this man had the audacity to declare I am El Popa I'm the Pope over all the world no, sir, you're 600 years too late. Jesus has already done it. He is the preeminent one. So I hope this morning that you have listened carefully. I hope that you have loved this series on mountains as much as I have. I could start and preach again next week. You know, I, mean, I, I couldn't handle that. <laughs> I love this series. But you know what? God's not only the God of the mountains, but we're going to talk about next week. He's the God of the valley. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. See, God's on the mountaintop when we're up here. But God's walking in the valley when we're going through the valleys. So I hope you can come back. I hope this morning, if you're not a Christian, that, that when we start singing this song, that you're going to be running down that aisle and you're going to say, Preacher, I need to be baptized in Christ. I need to hear the Word of God where you've heard it. I need to believe it, okay? Do you believe it? Are you willing to repent of your sins? Confessing Jesus as the Christ. Be baptized for the remission of your sins. We pleading with you to respond to the gospel. As one of God's children, if you have a need, please come as we stand and ask the same.